really taking a temperature read of where Mexico is. Um, this is a meeting on Mexico as opposed to U.S.-Mexico relations. We will have a panel later with Carlos and Leon talking about Mexican foreign policy, some of which is with the United States, but which is also broader than that. Um, we want to look at uh, this as a day on Mexico as opposed to Mexico just in relationship to the United States. But the idea of the dynamic here today is, is to have a conversation. We're going to have a couple panelists who will speak for 12 to 15 minutes at the beginning of each panel. We'll then go back to what is our resource team, all the panelists together, our resource team, and try and get some quick reactions from them. Um, they have been briefed or warned or whatever you want to call it that they are um, not only experts on their own subject but are, are commentators on every subject. And so the idea is getting a little bit of a temperature read from them also on how they see things. And then we'll go to the audience. And so, and all of you are sort of part of this dynamic. So hopefully this is a, an interactive group. I know it will be a little bit uncomfortable in this room, but if we had done this in the auditorium, the reality is we wouldn't have had that kind of interaction back and forth. So um, feel free to stand up and stretch your legs if you need to elbow your neighbor if it gets too close or she gets too close. But uh, we'll try and stay down in this room if humanly possible. Um, welcome. Uh, let me turn this over to Luis Rubio. We're incredibly pleased to be able to co-sponsor this with CIDAC. CIDAC is one of the premier uh, research institutes, um, both great convening power and great research capacity um, and great incidents in, in public policy in Mexico. Luis Rubio has has led it since its inception, almost since its inception, but since its inception as CIDAC and be, even before, um, and is in, in his own right also one of Mexico's premier uh, public intellectuals and scholars, and we're very pleased. He's a former scholar here at the Woodrow Wilson Center as well, and extremely pleased to be co-sponsoring with CIDAC and to have him back at the Woodrow Wilson Center, Luis. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, good morning to you all. Uh, it's it's a, a, a pleasure to organize this seminar together with Andrew and the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, I have not much to add to what Andrew just said, uh, except to say that the objective is to have a conversation, to explore ideas and issues, not to present conclusions, to get into a conversation with all of you, and to try to see what uh, are the issues looming in the horizon for Mexico and the complexities that come associated with them. Um, let me stop at that, and, and, and let's try to, to get this going. Uh, you want to start? Yes. Well, let me just say before we jump in, thank you to all the panelists who came. Yesterday was a snowy day, so we appreciate you braving Jesus the train that, that moves slowly down from uh, uh, from New York, and, and Luis had to come down from Boston, others from Pedro from San Francisco, everyone else from Mexico City, so appreciate you coming. Recognize Diana Negroponte, one of our board members for the Mexico as is Luis as well. Um, and Leslie Bethel, who is one of our public policy scholars, a distinguished uh, scholar of, of Brazil and Latin America back there as well, and I'm sure I'm overlooking others I should be recognizing, but welcome to all of you. Glad to have you here on a uh, on, on Snow Again uh, Part 2 here. Um, we're going to start off with a panel looking at Mexico's politics today. This is clearly the lead up into the 2012 elections. Um, this is something, we have the, our elections coming up in this country as well, but uh, we're very fortunate to have two premier uh, scholars and analysts who are also great speakers to, to lead us off talking a little bit about where Mexico is today as in the last two years of the Calderon administration and moving into what is often a very conflicted time, moving into to an election season. This really is the beginning of the election season. So, um, Jesus, I think we have you first on the program. Do you want to start off and then we'll go to Alejandro. Jesus is, I think most of you know, you have bios for everyone. Just quickly tell you he is a, a professor at, uh, at ITAM. He's currently, I believe, at Columbia University this semester. Um, the New School. New School, at the New School this semester. Um, he has been a scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center, and he is a, a phenomenal writer, um, has written a number of books and, and writes in Reforma. For those of you that follow his columns, you know he's a, he's a fantastic writer. And we'll turn to Alejandro Moreno, who is um, a, a one of the Mexico's, but also the world's great uh, scholars of public opinion. He is uh, a professor also at ITAM. Um, he's the director of public polling, of public opinion at Reforma, um, and was also just elected, can I say this publicly, the uh, vice president and president-elect of the World Association of Public Opinion Researchers, which is the international organization of public opinion, someone who has great recognition in Mexico and those that follow Mexico, but also among his colleagues around the world for his work on public opinion. So, Jesus. Well, thank you, Andrew. Uh, it's uh, really a pleasure to be back at uh, the Wilson Center, and um, and I really appreciate this opportunity to to uh, present to you what I would uh, uh, try to to draw as an overview of Mexican uh, uh, Mexico's politics. Um, I I think that one should start by stressing that Mexico still has. Uh, a fairly young democracy. Uh, uh, Luis and I were just uh, talking uh, a couple of minutes ago 
that even though that we, we might not be uh, um, of, uh, of different, very different generations, our experiences uh, as uh, columnists and writers in, in, in newspapers uh, started fairly differently. Uh, in, uh, because I, I would say that I had the opportunity of writing when Mexico had, uh, was, was beginning to open as a democracy. And, and, and Luis started a couple of years before when things, uh, <laughs> things were not, not that open. Um, and um, I, I would say that, um, that if we do not have like a, a child democracy, it's, it's, a, it's a teenager democracy. Um, it, it was only 13 years ago when pluralism was institutionalized in Mexico. Uh, before that, uh, Mexico had an hegemonic uh, political system and uh, basically uh, one party rule. It was in 1997 when Mexico uh, uh, became uh, a pluralistic uh, uh, political system, when its, its pluralism got institutionalized in uh, in an election where the president lost control of Congress. So that is, I believe, the, the, the main uh, um, element of Mexico's politics uh, from 1997 to this day, that we have lived democracy with uh, um, uh, the combination of pluralism and the lack of a, of a, a governing coalition. Mexico has lived these uh, realities as one reality. Democracy is, for Mexicans, the lack of a governing muscle, of a governing uh, uh, majority. Um, and I think that we should, uh, 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 we could be, we could uh, see Mexico's politics uh, um, by analyzing the problems in three levels of uh, analysis. The first, I think it's uh, uh, the one that is uh, the most dangerous, the most, uh, the, the, the level that is, uh, uh, that worries uh, Mexicans the most, that is uh, the problems of state capacity. Um, when Felipe Calderón was inaugurated in, on December of 2006, uh, his uh, clear priority was uh, to uh, recover uh, public order and to establish and to recover the territorial control uh, uh, of, uh, in Mexico. Uh, this was not, at, as it's been uh, argued basically recently in, in Mexico, this was not um, a struggle of... Uh, of will that Felipe Calderón decided that he wanted to pursue uh, um, uh, and to, to, to battle organized crime. It was a battle of necessity. If Andrés Manuel López Obrador was inaugurated on December of 2006, he would have to answer the uh, desperate call of uh, the governor of Michoacán to recover the uh, territorial control of that state that was, uh, uh, co that was basically under the control of drug traffickers. So uh, um, I think that, that we are facing uh, the problem of, uh, uh, of, of, of the, the problems of, of, of our state incapacity and that shows that after 70 years of uh, uh, authoritarian rule, there was order, but there, were not that <coughs> there was not state order. There was not a rule of law. Um, and uh, establishing that is something that we are starting to see is not something that you can do overnight. Um, I would... Uh, um, emphasize that w that was something that was not uh, a capricious decision of Felipe Calderón, that was not something that he did just to legitimize himself, but that was something that he had to do. 
That is not to say that, it's, that that strategy was the only one that he could pursue. And that is not to say that that strategy has shown uh, results in these uh, four years. I would say that the opposite is, has been showing. Uh, after four years of uh, what has been called the war against uh, organized crime, Mexico is much more violent than it was uh, four years ago. Uh, Mexico uh, has uh, uh, gone back in what was uh, like a civilizing path in, in its historical uh, um, uh, um, uh, I, I mean, it was it it was a, a um, going back in its civilization uh, um, progress, as we are a more violent uh, society now, and that is not to say that um, Mexican violence is just drug related and organized crime related. Uh, in a very interesting uh, article that's been published in the uh, monthly magazine Nexos, uh, Fernando Escalante has shown dramatically how uh, violent crimes and killings have uh, skyrocketed in the last uh, three years. And he, what he shows is that uh, these are not just uh, drug lords and, uh, and uh, the, the people that are uh, um, linked to, to, to the drug mafias in Mexico. But as uh, killings have uh, uh, gone up, the, um, they have shown that uh, violence is a way to solve things in Mexico. If you see every day in the morning, in the TV, on the, on the radio, in the newspaper, that uh, in your city, in your hometown, there have been 20 people killed, if you have a, a problem with your la a, a land problem, if you have a, a, an economic problem, well, maybe maybe uh, uh, you can solve that problem with a gun. And that, I think, is uh, the, the, the most, um, the basic problem of, of Mexican politics today and the basic problem facing the 2012 election is basically that we have to recover peace and order in Mexico so that we can have a... Uh, uh, an intense but peaceful campaign in uh, two th 2012. The second level uh, that we should um, uh, analyze, I think, is democratic performance. After we have, uh, 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 on top of the uh, state table and the, and the state um, basis, we need to understand that Mexico's uh, uh, democracy has not been able to perform. Uh, Mexico's uh, pluralism has not been able to uh, give the country the uh, reforms that it needs. And after 1997, we have been seeing that the reformist path that Mexico had has slowed down, if not uh, stagnated. I think that has uh, an institutional explanation. And that is pl institutional explanation um, uh, might be that we, we were able to change uh, the rules of the game. We were able to change the, the electoral uh, rules in Mexico quite successfully. <coughs> Mexico opened up its, its electoral system. Uh, created uh, autonomous uh, institutions to organize and to count votes. But we, we have not been uh, able to discuss what happens after you win office, after you are uh, uh, living in, in the presidential house, after you are uh, in your congressional seat. So uh, Mexico has... Uh, uh, had a, a, a democratic transition without 
redrawing its, uh, uh, inst uh, its democratic institutions. So what we have been discovering for the last uh, 10 years is that we have a terribly weak presidential system. We uh, have one of the weakest uh, uh, presidents in constitutional terms if we uh, uh, consider uh, uh, the Latin American map. Uh, the President Calderon uh, envies the powers that uh, the Brazilian president has, the Argentinian president has, the, uh, the president of Chile has. Um, and we have a very powerful Congress, but structurally irresponsible Congress, be because it has uh, one of the strangest anomalies in, in, in uh, um, the democratic world, that Mexico's, Mexicans cannot uh, punish or reward its uh, legislators. Uh, the, uh, the, one of the basic rules of Mexican authoritarianism, which was uh, uh, there has to be a renewal of the political class every three years because the, the Congress and, and the, the House of Representatives has to change uh, every person in the House, which was a, a very reasonable thing to do when you have a non-competitive uh, political system, is uh, a lousy arrangement when you have democracy. Um, so institutions are the, the, the second level of our concerns. The third level, I would say, is not, uh, uh, not the state not democracy, but something that might be more, uh, uh, more difficult to handle, and that's uh, leadership. Uh, Mexico did not have the fortune that many uh, new democracies had in, um, in Latin America or in, uh, Europe, that uh, there was a new political class that inaugurated democracy. Uh, we have not been able to uh, uh, renovate our uh, uh, political leadership in Mexico. Um, and what leaders in Mexico's politics have come to realize is that democracy is a stop sign. Democracy is a sign that says that everything that we need is democratically impossible. Uh, that if we need education reform, pluralism defines that that uh, um, reform is impossible. If we need energy reform, pluralism means that energy reform is impossible. Um, so what we have been uh, uh, living in the last 13 years, it's not only a democracy that, uh, um, uh, uh, that has not been able to perform, but a democracy that has been, hasn't been able to show an idea of our future. Uh, and I think that that is something that... Uh, uh, that is needed in, in Mexico. Uh, some idea of wh wh where we are heading. And Mexico, with, um, uh, with our violence, uh, with uh, politicking in Congress, hasn't been able to find out what does it want of itself in the next, next 20 years. Thank you. Uh, it, it's it's uh, an interesting uh, perspective to take if one looks at Mexico going forward. Um, it's astounding how complicated uh, it looks, how risky it looks, uh, and the issues that, that uh, Jesus has just presented uh, speak to that uh, widely, uh, starting with state capacity or state incapacity. Uh, on the other hand, if one looks back, it's amazing how much Mexico has changed. Um, it's astounding how Mexico has liberalized, has opened up, has uh, changed its, its structures, both economic as well as political. Uh, the question is how to bring that enormous uh, new reality into an ability to, to 
perform and develop for the future. Uh, one important question is what do the people think about it? And that's what Alejandro uh, has to, to address. Alejandro, I, I forgot to mention not only is, is he a, a great scholar and uh, deeply involved in issues of public opinion, but we're also very fortunate to have him here at the Wilson Center for two months. So for those that uh, want to pick his brain over the next couple of months, he's here in Washington. So we're in a program we have with Comexi. So Alejandro. Thank you very much, Andrew and Luis. Um, I have to join my colleague from ITAM, uh, Jesus, in saying that I belong to a different generation of political analysts. And... Um, not only because the times were different, the context to, to write and to use the right of freedom of expression, but also, and this is what I am particularly proud of, because political analysis, as Mexico started to democratize, passed, moved uh, slowly but very, very effectively from only studying political elites and their decisions and caring about what the people think about citizens' attitudes and opinions. And I think uh, uh, th uh, we have now had a whole generation of analysis that goes back perhaps 10 years, 15 years, and we have learned a lot about it. So I'm going to talk about that. I am a public opinion researcher, so you could expect I will be talking about some numbers. Not showing them, I <laughs> promise, just talking about them. The title of the conference was very... Um, challenging for me because uh, after one year that we have been looking at the past, at the two last hundred years, uh, two, 200 years and the bicentennial celebration, 100 years of the revolution, we are finally looking at today and especially tomorrow. Most people think that Mexicans do not look to tomorrow, and particularly politicians, especially in the long term. So what I'm going to do is uh, make a very brief depiction of what public opinion feels about the political situation today. What's coming in the short term for tomorrow, which uh, Andrew has referred to as uh, the election processes, and try to make, if time allows, a depiction of what Mexicans, ordinary Mexicans, are thinking about the next 10 to 20 years where the country uh, should go, what the goals should be, and whether we are in the right track to accomplish those goals. Today, what is the state of democracy? What is the health? Um, uh, Jesus, or Chucho as we, many of us call him, uh, um, he said we have a very young democracy, which I agree. He used the word a teenage democracy. What's the health? Uh, the state of health of this teenage democracy. Well, as a teenage democracy, it should be good. It should be strong. It should be going forwards. But the signs don't seem to be very positive today. Let me start by something that is not a poll. Last week, Freedom House told us that Mexican democracy has been downgraded. The Freedom House ratings, I quote, say that four countries this year received status declines including Ukraine and Mexico, which both fell from, part, from free to partly free, uh, and Mexico's downgrade was a result of the government's inability to stem the tide of violence of, by drug trafficking groups. Very much what you were saying, uh, Chuchu. But wait a minute, these are not polls again. These are expert evaluations. Experts are very critical of our democracy. What do people think? Well, people can be even more critical in this, in this issue of democracy these days. Today, Mexico, according to Latino Barometer data uh, gathered in 2010, has the lowest level of satisfaction with democracy in all Latin America. Only 27% of Mexicans say that they are satisfied with the way democracy is working. As a comparison, we have a regional average of 44%, and it goes as high as 78% in Uruguay, where we have the highest level. As opposed to that, seven out of 10 Mexicans say democracy is not working well. They're very dissatisfied. So Mexicans are not happy with democracy. And perhaps, of course, this reflects very well the, the violence that uh, Chucho was referring to, but also a crisis that has not stopped. The economic crisis are still, still in, uh, uh, being felt in the majority of Mexican households. 
In fact, Latin barometer data also shows that Mexico has the lowest level of satisfaction in the region with the functioning of the economy. And only one out of four Mexicans believe that the country is moving, is progressing, is advancing, as, as Luis was saying. The rest, uh, three-fourths of the population, the adult population at least, feel that we're stagnant, as Chucho was saying, or even worse, that we're moving backwards. It is hard for me to tell whether Mexico is moving at all, moving forward, or moving at all. But let's suppose that it is moving. A recent survey just conducted last, last uh, month, uh, November and December, a very, very beautiful survey, state-by-state state representation uh, on the values and what Mexicans believe that unites them and divides them. It shows us that um, even if we were moving as a country, two-thirds of the, of the interview, interviewees, respondents, said we're moving in the wrong direction. We're just not doing it right. I will return to this point later because it has to do with the goals that we have to set for the future. Um, but let me, let me uh, say that when we take the signs, the vital signs of the health of our democracy, I would like to finish this part with a, with a positive note. I usually end this, this bad news with a positive note. Most Mexicans are supportive of democracy. They're critical of it, but they support it. 80% of uh, respondents say that democracy is a good form of government, and about 76% say that it has a lot of problems, but it is the best system, that typical Churchillian question. So, yes, our teenage democracy may be sick, but most Mexicans, almost unanimously, want it to get better. To what extent dissatisfaction with democracy, oh, by the way, let me, let me make a, 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 a brief, brief parenthesis. The only bad news here is that um, uh, our democracy seems to be in the hands of the least trusted institutions in Mexico today, political parties. Political parties are not only distrusted, but they are seen as the single aspect in the country that divides Mexicans the most. You say that democracy is like a stop sign. I think that the polls are telling us people look at the parties as the stop sign. Not democracy itself, but the political parties. It's interesting, and I will come back to this point with the election, with the elect, elect, uh, discussion about the election, but on the positive side, Mexicans at least think, half of them think that parties actually represent different projects and ideologies. The other half thinks they are all the same. To what extent is it the satisfaction with democracy a simple reflection of dissatisfaction with government performance? We have one of the longest and most common measures in Mexico, uh, uh, public opinion, that typical Gallup question. Do you approve or disapprove of the way the president is handling his job? Well, after many years of keeping track of this question and seeing that it only goes down, approval ratings in Mexico only go down when the president, not the president, but when, when Congress uh, passes uh, increases in taxes. I mean, it happened in 95 when uh, they uh, increased the VAT from 10 to 15 percent. It happened in the second year of the Fox administration when uh, they were talking about taxing food and medications. And it happened recently when VAT went from 15 to 16 percent. That's the only time when really uh, presidential approval goes down. The rest of the time it just stays without moving no matter what, no matter what happens or how many people are killed in the war uh, of, against drugs. So I'm, I'm starting to have so serious questions about what this what this public opinion measure really tells us about in Mexico. Let me, let me explain. Today, depending on your poll of uh, preference, about 60% of Mexicans say that they approve of the way President Calderón is doing his job. Aside from Lula's in Brazil, that he had over 80%, this is a very high percent of uh, approval, uh, uh, a very high approval rating for Latin American <coughs> standards. And I would say even for American standards. But what happens when you look at other indicators? And uh, w one time in Reforma, we asked, we asked our respondents, why do you approve of the way the president is, do is, is doing his job, based on his results or what? Well, because he's echando leganas, you know? He's, he's, he's trying hard. 
I asked my students at ITAM once if uh, they agreed that their grades would be on the same basis of presidential approval. I said, well, of course, you know, I always say chandole ganas, but, uh, but uh, it's not based on performance. What happens when we look at other, other indicators about uh, public support? Well, let me take the latest uh, um, uh, quarterly poll by, by Reforma conducted last, last November. 58% say they approved of the president. It goes down to 49% when you ask them if they believe the president's messages. It was way, goes way down when you ask them if they approve of the way the president is handling the economy, 24%. So 58, 49, 24. But the president has blamed others for the economy. It's not his fault. It's not the country's fault. It came from abroad. Okay, let's look, take a look at the uh, the uh, issue of crime, the war, the war against drugs. 34% approve of the way the president is handling it. 25% believe that the federal government is winning that war, as opposed to more than 50% who think organized crime is winning. I repeat, two to one in favor, almost two and a half to one in favor of organized crime. 70% think that the number of deaths is unacceptable. This was taken when it, it was still on 24,000 deaths. I, I lost track, but I think it's over 30,000 now. And of course, 53% the majority think that the army is violating human rights in the war against drugs. So if you look at all these indicators, they are not very supportive of the government, as opposed to the 60% approval rating. Let me give you a, few, uh, a couple more just to change the topic. 31%, this is a little slightly less than one-third, see an improvement in the country after 10 years of pan-governments. 66%, two-thirds, feel that after 10 years, nothing has changed, or if things have changed, it has only for the worse. This, of course, is a very partisan-led kind of question. This, this, this reflects partisan preferences, uh, probably more than any other one. Uh, on the other hand, um, the majority of people, like I said before, believe that the country is stagnated. It's just simply not moving. And the question is why, uh, well, the question has been answered, but why such high approval ratings are not translating into support for the incumbent party? for the President's party. This is going to take us now to the tomorrow question in the short term. What about the elections? I'm going to skip for a lack of time this year's elections, which are very interesting. We have one this weekend in Guerrero, uh, in the summer in the state of Mexico with one of the main protagonists of the 2012 election. But let's, go, let's, let's just go directly to the presidential election. I'm going to start now with good news. Everyone has been thinking that the Mexican electoral system has been in crisis in 2006. Well, today, and usually when there is no election day, the trust in the Federal Elections Institute tends to be lower than during election times. But today, about 60% of Mexicans trust IFE. They think that elections are clean and fair, and we don't have a problem. That's a good news. We're OK in that front. And even better. Most respondents today, we will see if it happens or not, they say that they would like to vote for president in 2012. So that's good news. There are two major issues, I think, that we should look at when we talk about the forthcoming uh, presidential election. One, this thing about the coalitions, the alliances between PAN and PRD that we have seen in 2010 very successfully in Puebla, Oaxaca, Sinaloa, against, uh, um, in, in those states, the, the old ruling party, the PRI. But that are, um, yes, they were uh, electorally successful, but there has been a lot of talk about their ideological incongruence. These are um, not natural in terms of programmatic, programmatic goals. In terms of public opinion, the majority of Mexicans, in fact, rejects the idea of making these left-right alliances. 74% in the November poll, and we have, we have a more recent one that shows a similar percent, 
70% of respondents think that PAN and PRD, uh, is that my time up? No, no but, but you got about two minutes, so. Okay. <laughs> that is your two minutes. 74% of Mexicans think that PAN and PRD should not make an alliance <coughs> in 2012. They should have their own candidates. These are different parties, and this is something that is not said by a political analyst, like the ones distinguished, distinguished ones here, but by public opinion. The reason of the alliances is, of course, to face not only the, the governing PRI, as in, the, as in the states that I mentioned before, but now a PRI that is well ahead in the polls to, uh, in, the, in the road to 2012. And not only well ahead, but having more than 20% difference uh, between uh, preferences for the PRI possible candidate and the second place. In fact, most polls tell us that if you put together support for PAN and PRD separately, they're not even uh, close to what the PRI has today. So this has uh, made many analysts think that um, uh, the PRI is just going to win this election. Well, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, and, and one of the things I have learned doing polls all these years is that I'm never going to predict something, but I'm going to try to find the, 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 the elements to reach our, our own conclusions. The first one is, in 2000, at this time, or I should say 1998, the pre-candidate also had a possible candidate in trial hit questions, also had more than 20% lead, and he lost the election. 2004, Lopez Obrador had more than 20-point lead, and he lost barely the election. I'm not saying that, if in this case, the most likely pre-candidate, Peña Nieto, who has more than 20% lead, will lose the election. But let's think that w w when campaigns actually start, something happens. Preferences readjust, uh, people start thinking about politics. Right now, there is just only a contest of, uh, of candidate visibility. Span has nobody yet. PRD is in this division between who might be, who might not, whether they're going to be together or not. And PRI is almost taking for granted that it will be Peña Nieto. One trial hit the uh, uh, figure. Peña Nieto, 43%. Uh, López Obrador with a united left, all the leftist uh, parties uh, uh, supporting him as candidate, 21%. This is less than half. And the most popular PAN possible candidate today, 16%. This is way too low for a governing party. This, again, uh, may change very likely once there is a candidate and if the Mexican econo economy starts showing better signs of recovery in the next two years. Let me just point out a difference with 2000 and 2006. In 2000, the La Bastida lead was based on the pre-loyalists who never, ever thought that the pre would lose an election, but that were very affected by the uh, negative campaign uh, ran by the, Fox, by the Fox team. 2006, most of Lopez Obrador's lead was based on independence, and nobody ever told Lopez Obrador, perhaps, that independents are not loyal. Independents are independents. And then, guess what? They changed their mind in the, during the campaign. Now, who is giving Peña, Peña Nieto or the pre-candidate the advantage? Well, very surprisingly, pre-loyalists, as La Bastida, independents, as Lopes Obrador, and in addition, he's crossing party lines. He has a lot of PAN supporters and a lot of PRD supporters that are probably very dissatisfied with their own parties. Now, someone's going to have to tell Peña Nieto, as someone didn't tell Lopes Obrador, that if independents are not faithful, the partisans of other parties may be even less faithful. This is why I think that this 20-point 20, 20 advantage is going to be reduced. I'm not saying he's going to lose the election. He's still not a candidate, but we, we need to have those elements uh, uh, around. I, I will finish with a very short, uh, very, very short reference to the long-term future. What are Mexicans imagining? What are they depicting for the long run? Well, we had two questions in this recent survey on values, a state-by-state -state, uh, sample. Uh, on goals for the short term and for the long term. In this moment, today, 
the most important task for government is, as very well uh, uh, Chucho was saying, he, 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 he reads public opinion very well, is to fight crime. There is no other more important thing than that. This is an urgent situation. After that, much lower comes fighting poverty, creating jobs, much, much lower education and health and things like those. When you think about 10 years from now, and you ask people, okay, and what do, you, what do you think the goal for the country should be for the next 10 years, for this decade? Things related to crime, things related to public safety come in the lowest, in the bottom part of the priority list. Mexicans are not thinking that 10 years from now the government should be fighting crime. That needs to be solved today or in the next few years. Is that possible? I don't know, but this is what public opinion expects. And once that is done, then we can think about something else. First priority for the next 10 years, a strong economy that, that offers jobs and that these jobs are well paid. This is a dream, I know, but this is a goal that Mexicans have in their mind, a strong economy. Second, a strong democracy in which rights, liberties are respected, government is held accountable, and citizens participate. All these elements were offered to them. This is the second one. How do we read this? Mexicans are eager to build a strong economy, a strong democracy, but there is one little detail. There is the issue of crime, and crime has to be dealt with today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandro. We'll open it up to the panelists. Uh, we'd like to start with some discussion here. Any questions or comments? Diana. Diana. your three contexts, but I'd like to suggest that there may be a fourth. And I say this as someone who has a deep love for Mexico and has lived very happily within Mexico for four and a half years. And that is the transfer from a feudal society to a modern, individual, responsible society. And that takes time. Would you address this issue? of recent feudalism? Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I would use that uh, word. Um, but I, what, what I would say is that um, there, there's another level I would, I would uh, agree uh, that should be studied uh, uh, if we want to decipher what, what Mexican politics looks like today. And that's the the uh, the level of social organization. Uh, I, I I think that uh, that we are are living in a very slow transition in that field. Um, we used to think that um, uh, civil society was the the the, the, the strong machinery that uh, um, was responsible for political change and that might be uh, uh, fair in, 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 in some uh, in some areas in which there has been uh, improvement in, in, in civil society but I would say that uh, that Mexico's corporate structure is still very strong and living and that it's even stronger today than it was under the pre-rule. Because corporatism in, in, uh, all under the pre-authoritarian rule was disciplined uh, by uh, uh, vertical authority. And it has become loose. Um, so, <coughs> uh, so I think that that is one of the... the, the um, the, the uh, main obstacles for, for political and social change in Mexico. 
um, those old corporate structures, uh, uh, public unions, um, education, for example, it would be the, 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 the worst example of that. Um, and I would say that also in, in, a, in a style of organization, a style of social participation that is more uh, in tune with an authoritarian regime than win with a democratic regime. And I am thinking that we have uh, uh, the, the, the inertia of, of our social participation is the inertia of the organization, the petitionary organization. Um, it's it's not it's not a, a civil organization that deal with their immediate problems, but that organize to ask government to solve their problems. Uh, I think that's the, the like like the polar opposite of the Tocquevillian model of uh, uh, voluntary associations is what we have today in Mexico. If I can put in a, a quick um, sales announcement here. Uh, there's a book that is a display copy out there called Mexico's Democratic Challenges, and I, this was not by design, but, but the opening chapter is by Alejandro Moreno and the closing chapter is by Jesus. And uh, I just realized that as you're speaking, but, but he speaks exactly to that point in the, in the concluding chapter, and it's available from Stanford University Press for a modest price. So. <laughs> You want to, Leon, from the resource, and we'll come back to the audience, but, but yes, we'll give you a bit of priority to the resource team. So, Leon, if you want to jump in here, and then we'll head back to some of the hands here. Yeah, we, we need the microphone just because uh, there's folks actually following us by web. Uh, oh, all right. So, uh, I agree with, with Jesus, and I, I, I thought that the, the idea of feudalism in Mexico was uh, an interesting one. I, I think we should add a couple of things. First, that we should also think of Mexico at the local level. At the local level, as, uh, as one goes down the ladder, Mexico has become increasingly difficult to govern. I mean, when one uh, uh, interviews uh, 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 the heads of uh, municipalities all over Mexico, you find that uh, the old feudalism, the old uh, corporativist uh, structure in Mexican politics is alive and well at the local level, and uh, even at the state level, when you uh, uh, research, for example, recent uh, tragedies in Mexico, like the Guarderia ABC in Sonora, uh, in which 50-something kids were uh, killed by a, uh, uh, by a fire, and you uh, find out how the, the, the state level and the municipality of Hermosillo answered to the call of the civil society there, you, you, you realize that uh, democracy and uh, some sort of uh, rule of law uh, came into Mexican society at the federal level, at the local and the state level. Uh, the old ways are alive and well, and that's, I think, very important. And when you add to, to the municipalities uh, conflict the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the problem of uh, criminality, then it really gets difficult. And the other thing is that, uh, and we had a, a, a very nice debate yesterday uh, at dinner with, uh, with Alejandro yesterday uh, on this subject. We were talking about the, 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 the case of La Bastida and López Obrador and how in both cases both uh, leading candidates uh, ended up losing, and um, we, we, uh, I told him that uh, in, in both cases, uh, negative campaigning or uh, uh, campaign by contrast was still available in Mexico, and now it's not. Uh, so I think that's an element that when one thinks of the 2012 election, one should definitely add, because to uh, reduce a, a candidate's popularity, such as Peña Nieto's popularity, the guy has a 95 percent uh, uh, recognition uh, uh, index, that's not the right phrase, but I think you understand what I'm saying, and has a, 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 an extreme popularity, you have, you have to, to have some sort of negative campaigning to reduce his lead. And that's just not possible by the rules in Mexico, rules set up after 2006, in my opinion, to protect 
uh, López Obrador's eventual candidacy uh, uh, that was, of course, going to be attacked by a, a, a negative campaign. And uh, that's no longer possible in Mexico. And in my personal opinion, I just don't see any scenario in which Peña, Nieto, uh, uh, Peña Nieto's lead could be, could be reduced uh, as things stand right now. And then we'll go back uh, to other hands here, and then we'll come back to this side. Uh, Peter, if you just wait for the mic, Peter Hakem from the American Dialogue. Thank you. Uh, if I sort of closed my eyes and I sort of didn't look at the names on the nameplate, then I thought that these were American uh, commentators talking about the U.S. Uh, uh, you know, words like democracy is a stop sign, no ability to define the future dissatisfaction with all kinds of political and public institutions headed in the wrong direction. Uh, the poll numbers, the least trusted institutions are the political institutions. Uh, the way the president is handling the economics, way below his uh, approval ratings. Uh, the uh, reactionary unions, etc. And, you know, I just listen and I, I come to sort of think a little bit about, you know, the problems that the Europeans are having. And I wonder whether the problems really lie in Mexicans' government structure or that these problems of modern societies, modern, are just too difficult. I mean, they're just not easy to, to solve. Uh, they're sort of, uh, that there's so many points of gridlock, of stagnation, and, uh, you know, Mexico has some terribly difficult problems. And is it the institutions and the leadership, or is it the sort of nature of society and problems now? Uh, why don't we take a couple other questions, if the, if the Jesus and Something Ed, about know, Egypt. With this? Egypt, yes, exactly. <laughs> China we could throw in there somewhere. D Daniel, why don't we take you and then gentlemen over Hi, uh, Daniel Sabet from uh, Georgetown University. Uh, quick question for Jesus and for Alejandro. Uh, for Jesus, you mentioned the the, the problem of no re-election. Uh, this always comes up. Uh, popular opinion very against it. What under what kind of situation or scenario? What needs to happen for uh, to make those political changes to allow for re-election to become a, a possibility? And uh, for Alejandro, one of the biggest changes has been in the area of public opinion research, tons and tons of numbers and information coming out of Mexico. What are the kind of reliability and, and validity concerns that we need to have when we're looking at uh, public opinion data coming from Mexico? Thanks. The gentleman across the way from you, yes. And then we'll go back next to this side after they respond. Yeah. My question does relate to the uh, previous question, and that is one that focuses on institutions, institutional development. I'm sorry, your name? Uh, Larry Heilman. I'm with the Anthropology Department over in the Smithsonian. Uh, there was significant expenditures throughout the 90s and into uh, uh, the new millennium in the whole area of improving uh, uh, the electoral process, the electoral system. Uh, expenditures both made by the Mexican government and by foreign governments, uh, all done in a very transparent way. You've concluded that the system worked, worked very effectively. I'm curious about the kind of expenditures that have been made uh, in the last 20 years in the whole area of rule of law, in the whole area of creating the civil society. And is there any relationship between focusing on these problems, making expenditures that have specific objectives, and some making some progress? Because it looks like what you've described is that the whole series of enabling institutions uh, that have to exist to make democracy work are just faltering except for the electoral process. Alejandro and Chucho, do you want to take a shot? Uh, well, I, I would like to start with, with um, uh, I think, the very deep uh, argument on on, on the possibility of, of that we, we could be discussing any country in the world, any democracy. And, and, and I think that's, uh, that's interesting because I think we need to, to, um, to assess in Mexico what are the problems of a democracy and what are the problems of, um, of our democracy. And I think that we are living, we, we have trouble uh, 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 drawing the line 
between what is the, the, the problem of democracy. Uh, democracy makes agreement difficult, uh, 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 tries to make governing a hard thing to do because you don't have just to, uh, what, how do you say that? You snap your, snap your fingers, <laughs> no? Um, it, it, it must be hard, and I think that we uh, had been used to the word of one man that decided, today I want the banks to be state property. Tonight I want them to be private property. And that happened. Um, so so I, I, I think that's, that's a very fair uh, assessment. We need to distinguish the problems of a democracy, and, and democracy are problematic, and the problems that are particularly Mexican. I think insti the institutional design is a, a problem that we have. We do not have re-election, for example. And how does a democracy work? How does a, a Congress work if, 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 uh, um, if you are not able to uh, punish your, your senator or your uh, uh, representative? Uh, I think that is uh, our problem. Uh, I would say, and I, I don't know if that connects with the third question, that, uh, that we should be more skeptical than we used to be uh, about uh, the relevance of institutions. I think uh, political science in, in the 80s and 90s w was under the, the idea that democracies worked perfectly if, if they had the perfect institutions. And we just, you need to, to design the, the, the good parliamentary system and the good electoral system, and everything would uh, uh, get in place. I think that's absurd. And, and, and uh, you can have a, a functioning democracies with weird institutions, and you can have very good uh, institutions, very well designed, that don't work at all. So we, I think we have to be skeptical about that, recognizing the importance of, of institutions, but without the idea that we need to, to, uh, to discover the, the happy uh, uh, arrangement. Um, and uh, finally, the issue of, of, of the, the um, of re-election, how, how would it be possible? I, I think you, you might have a, a better assessment of that. It's, it's an unpopular thing in Mexico. It, it, if, if Congress and parties are that unpopular, the uh, idea of them being more time in power, it sounds <laughs> horrible. Um, um, and I think that there's another big problem, that is that uh, re-election is a bad, uh, bad idea for party bosses. Hmm. Alejandro? I'll start with uh, Peter Hagim's uh, um, invitation to, to, to think about how Americanized Mexican politics is. Um, uh, and, and I must say that also, um, I probably belong to a generation that, that learned that Mexican politics was unique, that we were different to everyone else, that Mexico had to be understood only in comparison to Mexico itself. And I think that was a mistaken view. The more we study Mexico, the more uh, we see that we are like many other countries and that we also uh, have a few differences. One of them is uh, has to do with, the, with uh, Leon's question. He's saying, um, you know, we passed a new law, the Congress passed a new law, we are not allowing to tell candidates ugly things to each other, and that assumes that because it's the law, Mexicans will follow it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but this is Mexico, again. If it was the U.S., Peter, I believe it. Okay, a law changed and that will change the behavior of citizens and candidates. And whoever doesn't you know, uh, uh, follow the law, there will be a cost. Well, not in Mexico, I don't think so. And right after the law was passed, negative campaigning has continued. Yeah. It has continued in different, in different um, uh, forms. One of them, which actually ties up candidates against this, is that every time there's going to be an election, it just happened this week in Guerrero, there is a leak 
about some information that some candidate is related to drug deal, and he cannot respond because he is under a law that restricts him. But somebody's going to tell me, hey, that wasn't a campaign from a candidate. No, but it was a leak of information that was all over the media, and that is campaigning. I'm sorry, but the law is being broken. Even if IFE or anyone or the uh, uh, local election authorities don't even notice that it's been broken. So I'm sorry, the law is not going to, to, to stop negative campaigning. And the other, the other fact, and I, 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 I'm, I'm, uh, th this is a discussion that might take longer, so I'm just going to make it very brief. What is negative campaigning? The law doesn't define it very well. It says, do not denigrate your opponent. What does that mean? Does that mean I cannot say that his policies didn't work or that I cannot say that he's a drug lord? So there is a very fine line there between when I'm, I'm, I'm attacking somebody and when I'm not. And I think that Mexican politicians and Peter, his American consultants, are very good and go, at going around the law in this. <laughs> Finally, are polls reliable? What a good question. And I appreciate that, I, that I'm asked that question because uh, sometimes we forget they may have some problems. And as, uh, um, uh, as much as I love what I do, public opinion research, I must say that we have always have to have a critical eye on them. First, in Mexico, like in, many, in, in any other country, this is part of the World Association for Public Opinion Research set of codes. You have to look at who conducted, how it conducted it, when, why, a lot of questions, but the most important one that you have to take into account anywhere, and particularly in Mexico, who paid for it? Who paid for it? A lot of Mexican polls, and I say this, and I, uh, I say it with my, with my colleagues in the polling industry, do not tell you who pays for them. They are in the media, they are in the newspapers as if they were media polls, but they're actually paid by a candidate or by a party. So we need to know not only who is making them, who is conducting them, why they are conducting them, when, how, uh, uh, among whom, all these technical questions, but who paid for them. And that would be a good criteria for us to know whether it's a trusting poll or not. Thank you. I'd like to interject for a second. Um, Peter's question, I think, is an irrelevant one. Uh, uh, whether democracy works or doesn't work uh, is an important question, and that's true for the, the world over. And, and I agree with what, how Chucho responded to that. However, I think one can push it too, 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 too far. Uh, Chucho's first uh, statement was about Mexico's state capacity. And the, that, that's, a, that's a very different level of, of discussion from the U.S. Uh, U.S. state governments, U.S. federal government has much a wider net of, a, uh, um, of structures that allow it to work, to operate, to deliver. Uh, Mexico's problems with violence, to a large extent, uh, signal the, or show the, the way Mexico's institutions or Mexico's ability to respond to uh, organized crime or to other challenges has diminished over the years. So, so I don't think, and we think we have to be careful to, to push too far the comparison of democracy. It's, it's a valid point. But that assumes that state capacity is there, and I'm not sure that that's true for Mexico these days. Let's, we're, going to, we're going to go over to this side of the room. Uh, Dolia, and then Eric, you had your hand up as well. And then we'll come back to the panelists. Um, it was, we're running a little bit over time. We started late, however, and we'll give the, every one of the panelists a chance to respond, whoever wants to. Yeah, I'm Dolia Esteves, and I have a very quick question for especially Alejandro, I guess. He's the expert on polling. Um, I've seen polls that indicate that uh, the, econo the economy, the economic problems in Mexico is, are, is actually the main concern. Uh, I read something along those lines in uh, The Economist recently. So I was wondering if you can clarify whether it's the uh, violence, the security problem, or the economy in your research uh, or polls, uh, because it's not clear to me. And second, if uh, the PRI candidate is as ahead as most polls uh, show, something like 20 percent, I was wondering if there's a connection between um, the uh, fact that the economy or the uh, violence 
are the main concern of the electorate with the fact that he's ahead. Because up to now, I have not seen anything coming from the PRI or, or uh, Peña Nieto himself that would indicate uh, something to the population that, that he has a strategy or a plan or a policy to uh, either reduce violence or straighten out the economy. So I was wondering, why is he ahead? Uh, is there a connection with the fact that the population is concerned with violence or the economy, whatever that, whatever, you know, comes number one in your polls? Eric. I was just going to... Eric Olson from the Wilson. I, I was just going to ask uh, the panelists. Um, th there seems to be an interesting uh, juxtaposition of this notion that the par political parties are, the, the, I guess, the most distrusted or despised. But when you're asked, when they're asked, you, you know, should you run joint candidates, where political parties become sort of less significant, it seems to me, they don't want that either. They want people to run under their political, their banners. And I guess the the question that emerges out of that is. Uh, even if political parties are despised uh, publicly, they seem to be incredibly powerful still in Mexico. Do you foresee a time when, uh, you know, there's a movement towards independent candidacies? I know that's been rumored around López Obrador, uh, but, you know, I think if you were a clever politician, you would find a way to run with sort of the subterranean support of a party, but not the... You know, public support of a party if that's if that's a bad thing you know so is there a tendency will there be a tendency in that direction uh, going forward or is our parties just too strong and too much of a reality in Mexico even if they aren't much liked does anyone else from the the resource team want to jump in question comment before we go back to Alejandro and Chucho and they get the final word okay you guys have it well, let me let me start uh, to you now, if that's okay. Well, thank you again for the questions, Dolia. Um, you're you're right, and and um, I, I must clarify what what the main concern is. Uh, 2008, 2009, the economy grew as the main concern among Mexicans. It was clear the unemployment was very high. We were uh, capturing in the in the polls that uh, people were really really going through a very hard time, just like. In, in many other countries, but uh, this clearly has to do with, with the level of dissatisfaction with the government, whether uh, it, it, we can blame it, blame it or not. Uh, but as I should say that starting last year, at some point, the economy started to, to, to um, decrease in importance as main concern, and crime is now by far, by far, the main concern of Mexicans. This, is, this, this has changed over the last few months, and it has to do with the fact that violence, as Trichuk said very well, uh, has increased. I didn't mention this, this number because I, also, I, I, I just threw a, a lot of numbers to you already, but uh, almost two-thirds of Mexicans think that drug-related violence has reached their communities. They're not seeing this on television anymore or listening in the radio. They believe that it's around their homes. And, and, and when, I, when we asked last year in this, this beautiful survey, state by state, what the main um, failure, we, we asked also for achievement, but, but what the main failure of the country has been in 200 years of independent life, they didn't go and, and look at their history annals. They said, today's violence. And that was a very high percent, I don't remember which one, but it was the violence. So there is no doubt that right now, today, crime is the number one issue. Is it affecting the, the PAN's uh, chances for 2012? Of course, as much as the economy. I would, not, I would not frame the question as, is it the economy or is it crime and violence? It's both and probably uh, some other, some other uh, uh, aspects as well. One of them was mentioned by, by Jesus, leadership. There is still no leadership uh, 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 in, in the pan. There is still no one who is seen as a possible candidate. And uh, the president himself is losing his, uh, is, is, is decreasing in his numbers about leadership. So um, why is he so ahead? Well, also because there is no campaigns. There is no election yet. 
And this has happened, uh, like, like I said, in the last two election processes. So there's going to be a lot to think about as we approach the election and see how the economy behaves in the next 15 months or so. And, and I would add also something that I mentioned here last November in another conference, uh, uh, Andrew. Um, I have reported on the, on the um, partisan orientations of Mexico for about 20 years now, when we started doing polls. And for the first 10 years, I detected or, or, or reported a decline of pre-arrived partisanship and an increase of the other two parties and independents. Now we're, look, we're looking at it differently. PRD and PAN are losing supporters by the day, and pre- and independents are becoming more numerous by the day. This means that uh, Peña Nieto also has a higher, a higher uh, basis of support as uh, uh, um, Madrazo had six years ago or four years ago. So, um, and, and Eric, your question about, it has to do with this exactly. You, you point out a paradox. Parties are the most distrusted institution, but paradoxically, a lot of Mexicans are still very partisan. Well, one of, one of the things I've seen is that they're less and less partisan. Uh, uh, the, the number of independents is growing, and this reflects the dissatisfaction with the, with the PRD and PAN, mostly, because, as I said, the PRI is gaining new supporters, even among newer generations. This is, this is what I said <laughs> last November. It's recruiting uh, people who, 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 who has been born in the last... Uh, uh, the last cohort of Mexicans who are going to be able to vote in 2012. Um, this is a, a cohort that, as many of you know, has not seen any party govern at the national level <coughs> but the PAN. The PRI is a novelty for these guys, you know? So they're, they're, they're actually sympathizing with it. Um, we will have an independent candidacy. Well, Mexico is trying to move that way. Jorge Castañeda is trying to move that way. But mm -hmm. I don't think we will see it in 2012. It's just not, not I, I don't think they will be discussing that. It may be, I may be mistaken, but I just see it very, uh, not very likely. Uh, it involves changing laws. It, it involves changing the, the election laws. And I just don't think we will be seeing it in 2012. Does that mean that we will not have independent candidates? No. They may not be official, but if you remember in one of the last elections we had Dr. Simi, mm. the pharmaceutical guy, just asking in television, you know, vote for me, write my name in the, in, in the empty box down there, even if it's not official, you know, it just obviously didn't work. But there was, a, there was an independent candidacy right there. We will have it official? I don't think so. Jesus? I would just, ju I would just uh, add that... Um, even though they might be um, so disliked, uh, uh, parties, uh, uh, the three big parties um, still hold the uh, a huge majority of the votes. How many, uh, I mean, if you add 90, 90 more or 90 something of, of the vote, the three big parties. So they are disliked when, when, when pollsters ask them if, if you like parties and everybody says, I hate them but they still vote for the PRI, the PAN, or the PRD. Um, so they, they, uh, I think that's, that's paradoxical. There was a movement in the 2009 election uh, to reject that uh, uh, um, hold of the political system by the three big parties and to ask for independent candidacies. <laughs> And even the president, uh, uh, Felipe Calderón, in his uh, proposal for political reform, establishes that he considers that every uh, uh, seat could be um, won by a, a, a candidate without a party. So there's, there's uh, something um, growing in favor of independent uh, candidates. I don't think that in the, in the next election we will have a... Uh, um, the legal possibility of an independent candidate. Well, for the 2009 future was uh, void, void vote. Void vote. Void vote. That, that's different than independent candidate. It was but a, asked people to vote and just cross everyone, so but, it was But void. sort of with that agenda, we reject all these parties. We need uh, uh, alternatives. We need uh, 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 an easier way to, for, to establish a party, or we want 
uh, independent citizens to run for office, right? Well, fabulous. This is a, a, has been a great panel and a great lead off to the discussion. Um, we're not going to actually take a break, so please don't move except for the three of us up here. Luis will stay up here. Um, if we can invite Jaime and Pedro to, to come up to the front here, and Alejandro Chucho and I will, will step down, and we'll move straight into the economic panel here. We'll take a break after that panel. So for those that are worried about, you know, getting more caffeine, if you can hang on for another hour or, or walk out quietly. Um, yes. Criminal justice reform. Criminal justice reform. Nobody is caring. Why? Why nobody cares? Okay, uh, let's go on. This second panel is about the economy. The, the the question I think has been framed in the in the first panel and has to do with whether. Is it possible to have a strong economy? Uh, ultimately, that's what, what uh, this is all about. Uh, we have two exceptionally uh, uh, qualified and, and uh, competent uh, speakers here. Uh, one is uh, Jaime Sabludowski. Uh, he's a PhD from Yale. He was uh, Mexico's uh, negotiator for NAFTA. Um, and he was ambassador to the, to the uh, European Union to negotiate the, the uh, free trade agreement with the European Union. Um, today he is the president, is president, vice president of, of the ECOM. ECO. No, president. president of ECOM, but he, he's uh, the, uh, the, the president of, of the ConMexico, uh, a group of, of companies that uh, are in the, consum in the consumer business. Pedro Noyola is a, uh, a PhD from, from Stanford. Uh, he was the Undersecretary of Incomes and the Undersecretary of um, help me, Foreign Investment, I think, no? Trade. Of Trade. Um, he's uh, been a long time observer of the Mexican economic scene. Um, he runs a company called the Clara, uh, which has been trying to introduce or to reduce uh, corruption in Mexico by by bringing a, um, a bidding process to government acquisitions lately. Um, Jaime, please. Okay. <coughs> well, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. And well, uh, uh, I have a presentation uh, in, in PowerPoint that I, I will be uh, presenting. It has. Uh, Three parts. I'm going to talk before, uh, to start with about the economic crisis in Mexico, how we felt the crisis, and what were the uh, forces behind the crisis. Then how the Mexican economy is recovering after the crisis, and then some of the challenges that Mexico has ahead. Well, uh, after the 1994 crisis, I think this is the second largest NAFTA crisis in the sense that, uh, for the very first time we can see the fate of the two economies, the Mexican and the U.S. economies, uh, getting together. So um, I, it's, Mexico was one of the most affected countries. And also, for the very first time in our history, it, this, is, this was a crisis that was not caused by us. This is a crisis that was imported from abroad, and but that had huge <coughs> impacts into the Mexican economy. Uh, the other factor is that uh, the sectors that were the engines of growth during the 90s and early uh, years of this decade were the transmission channels of this crisis. In 1994 and 1995, the sectors that pulled out the Mexican economy from the crisis were the sectors related to the external sector. And this time, as we will see later, these same sectors were the contagion mechanism that put the Mexican economy in a very serious situation. And obviously, because of the size of the crisis, what we could do in Mexico was not enough to offset the impact of the international crisis. Well, this puts uh, the picture very clearly. There's a saying in Mexico that goes, when the U.S. 
gets a cold, Mexico catches pneumonia. Well, you will see in the next figures and in the, the, the next numbers the impact of the pneumonia that Mexico caught during the 2008 and 2009 crisis. Well, what were the channels of transmission? Well, four parts of the external sector. If you look at the external account of Mexico, you have foreign direct investment, tourism, remittances, and most importantly, trade, exports, both of goods and services. And in 2007, uh, well, 2008 and 2009, we saw a huge contraction of these uh, sources of foreign exchange, and particularly in, term, in terms of exports. Exports went from almost $300 billion in 2007 to uh, $230 billion. It's a huge contraction of the most important engine of economic growth in Mexico. Not surprisingly, Mexico was one of the most uh, seriously affected countries during this crisis. If you look at these uh, numbers of GDP growth from 2008 to 2009, the Mexican economy uh, contracted more than 6%. Only Japan had a worse performance than Mexico in these years. Now, one of the things that was remarkable, and I think that proves that institutions do matter, was macroeconomic handling. And I would say that the autonomy of Mexico's central bank has proven, particularly in this crisis, to be one of the most important assets of the Mexican economy. We had a very prudent fiscal management and a remarkable flexible exchange rate policy that allows us, not on, obviously, not to eliminate the negative impact of the crisis, but at least to soften the impact and to have a relatively painless adjustment. And I think one of the reasons why the polls have reflected today that the economy is not as important as it used to be is the macroeconomic stability. One of the things that explain that better explain the popularity of the Mexican president is macroeconomic stability. Every time that you have a huge devaluation, what you have is inflation and then expropriation of your savings. I think that this handling of the macroeconomic crisis during 2008 and 2009 proved the flexibility and the resilience of the Mexican economy particularly because now we have a very strong central bank and also the Treasury has realized, and I would say even the Congress, I think that today we have a very strong consensus about the importance of both fiscal stability and monetary stability and flexible exchange rates. And these are some, of, uh, some indicators about uh, macroeconomic uh, stability. Our fiscal balance compare not only, obviously, to the uh, peaks country in Europe, but also to the, the other developing countries is remarkable. In spite of not having a fiscal reform, which I, uh, we will see later is one of the key pending issues, with limited resources, we were able to face the storm and weather the crisis. Uh, perhaps one of the most important elements in economic policy handling was the flexibility of foreign exchange uh, rate. You can see here different uh, parities vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. dollar, and the lower, the lower graph is the Mexican peso. As you can <coughs> see we had a huge uh, impact in our foreign terms of trade, and by having a very flexible exchange rate, we were able to uh, soften the blow and be able now, as you will see, uh, even gain competitiveness in terms of our exports vis-a-vis -vis other countries. And at the same time, we have been accumulating reserves. This is a huge issue. It has to be with this currency 
uh, wars that we are witnessing all over the world, and Mexico has been playing it also very aggressively. Now, in terms of recovery, well, I would say that last year we have a rather vigorous recovery. The Mexican economy bounced back, and again, it bounced back led by the external sector. Uh, as you will see in some figures that, and some graphs that I'm going to show uh, a little bit ahead, the Mexican external competitiveness has been remarkable, and this has to do with location, the preferential access that Mexico has today to over 40 countries because of our free trade agreements, and because a very strong institution, which is the NAFTA. So again, there is, uh, there is the value in some institutions that Mexico has been able to build over the last 20 years. And particularly cost advantage vis-a-vis -vis two of the most important suppliers in the US into the US economy, Canada and China. And last year we have, uh, uh, well, we're expecting now to have uh, not big enough rates of growth, but at least we're going to be able to face the elections in a scenario of positive road rates. Well, this is, this is again the breakout of the sources of growth of the Mexican economy, and you could see that in 2010, exports were again the most important engine of growth, and this is going to be again the case in 2011. Perhaps this is one of the most important uh, graphs that I, I want to share with you. This is the competitiveness of Mexico's uh, foreign exchange rate vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China. And as you can see, in 2002, there was a huge disparity in terms of cost advantage of China vis-a-vis -vis Mexico. Now, because of Mexico's price stability and also the foreign exchange rate management that we had over the last couple of years, and also because of the inflation, inflationary pressures that uh, China is now facing, the cost advantage of China vis-a-vis -vis Mexico is falling very, very rapidly. And if you look at this graph, I think this is perhaps the most important graph that I want to share with you today. Since NAFTA entered into force, there has been a huge structural change in the U.S. trade. If you look at this graph, what we have here is U.S., Mexico, Canada, and China share of U.S. non-oil imports. First of all, NAFTA partners have had over these 15, 17 years, 25% of U.S. imports. What has, what has changed very dramatically is the composition. Canada used to have almost 20% and Mexico 7%. Last year, for the very first time, I would say, in Mexico and US history, Mexico became the second supplier of US non-oil imports, displacing Canada. So even though NAFTA still represents 25% of US imports, what has changed is that Mexico has been taking pl the place of Canada, which is a huge change in terms not only of economic structure, but also in terms of the relationship within North America. And obviously China has been growing very rapidly, but Mexico, even though the gap is still very, very uh, big, Mexico has been gaining advantage. So what's the... What's the future? And with this, I would like to start closing my presentation. Uh, obviously, uh, we, have had, we have been able to have a very prudent and a very responsible fiscal policy. And also, it's evident that our export sector is still very competitive. Even taking into consideration that the export activities in Mexico are very much concentrated in the most violent parts of the country for obvious reasons, as for the same reason that export activities are in the northern part of Mexico, 
Drug activities, which is another export activity, is also concentrated in that part of the country. The same logistical advantages, the same advantages of proximity and, uh, and uh, possibility of tapping the U.S. market apply not only to non-drug exports, but also to illegal exports as well. So in spite of, for example, the Ciudad Juarez, the Ciudad Juarez biome processes, the export activities in Ciudad Juarez are still growing and growing very rapidly, which is, I, I think, a, a major development and something that has to be uh, uh, obviously analyzed. But uh, macroeconomic stability and export activity obviously is not going to be enough to have a, a sustainable growth path in Mexico, particularly if we want to reach rates above 4 or 5 percent per year. Why so? Well, obviously because it's still very concentrated in some parts of the Mexican economy, but also because the U.S. economy is not going to be the engine of, of growth that was during the last 15 years, uh, particularly in the medium and longer term. It might be the case that 2000 and this year we might see a, a robust growth in the U.S., and that might be a transfer to the Mexican economy, but obviously in the medium term the U.S. economy will not be able to pull uh, out the Mexican economy at, as it used to do in the previous 15 years. So what is needed in Mexico, and obviously everybody knows that, but as uh, the previous panel shows us, it is one thing is to know the, the uh, diagnosis, but a very different, different uh, thing is to be able to implement and have the political uh, consensus to put these reforms um, um, into. So uh, what is needed? Well, I think that everybody agrees that we need a fiscal reform that would broaden the base, eliminate special regimes. I'm sure that Pedro will talk about that. Pedro also was an undersecretary of uh, the tax policy. That, so you are, I'm sure that you are going to talk a little bit about that. And also uh, enhance accountability and transparency of public expenditure, particularly at the subfederal level. I think that the Mexican society has been rather able to monitor public expenditure at the federal level. What still has to be done is to lower that to state governments and municipal governments, which are now completely out of control. <coughs> they don't have to, they don't have responsibilities in terms of tax, collect tax collection, but they are very efficient at spending the revenues that they get. And obviously, I also think that there's room to open up the Mexican economy to uh, foreign direct investment, even without touching the Mexican Constitution. There are some sectors that are still protected by law, and I think that eventually this will have to be discussed because there are very important sectors in, in the Mexican economy that are preventing and are hampering other sectors from growing more rapidly that have to be exposed to more competition and to more liberalization. And last but not least, I think that the North American agenda has to be retaken. And it has to be retaken both internally I think that over the last 15 years we have think we have thought about NAFTA in terms of a region, but looking within the region. I think that now we have to start thinking vis-a-vis -vis other markets. If the U.S. economy is serious about doubling its exports over the next five years, it has to be done within NAFTA because within NAFTA we have now the productive chain. And the only way that some key activities in the U.S. Are, to, are going to be competitive in other markets is by the possibility of integrating Canada, Mexico, and the U.S. 
into that uh, export activity. For example, the automotive industry, if the U.S. wants to export to other markets, it has to be able to bring inputs and activities from Canada and Mexico. And the only, the best way to do that would be by, for example, the U.S. just concluded the negotiation with South Korea for a free trade agreement. I think that it would be ideal to have the possibility of, it's a rather technical issue, but of accumulating value added among Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. to be able to enter into the Canadian, in, into the Korean market, because otherwise the cars that are going to be sent <coughs> to Korea will have to be completely and exclusively built into, in, in the U.S. So I do think that NAFTA, or at least regional integration, has to be, has to, to, to start thinking in terms of other markets because the U.S. market is not going to be able to um, provide the sources of growth, not only for Mexico, but also for the rest of the, regi the region. Thank you. Thank you, Jaime. Pedro, please. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, the Center and CIDAC for, for this invitation. It's, and, and also Jaime for uh, sharing the table with me. It's, uh, he's always a hard, hard act to follow. Uh, I, I would li I'd like to frame my, my comments in two basic parts uh, by, by formulating two questions. The first one is, is the current macroeconomic stability, the financial stability that Jaime referred to, sustainable? And the second one, oh, and I didn't, I, we didn't talk about our presentations, so, so this is um, quite coincidental, but the second one also refers to what Jaime addresses, is what uh, are the sources, the potential for long-term growth and competitiveness of the Mexican economy? So I would like to address those two questions. And to do so, I must disclose to you a, 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 my bias as I formulate my comments and as I prepared for today's presentation. During the last 30 years, I, I, I've sp I spent about 10 of them in academia, about 10 of them in public service, and about 10 of them now in private practice. And, I've, and the relative rigors of each type of activity are different. Uh, for example, and, and to, to be precise, uh, I remember uh, originally I, being uh, in, in when I was uh, developing theoretical mathematical models, uh, analytical rigor was trumped. Uh, considerations for institutional constraints or even practical uh, realities. When I moved to public service, institutional considerations tend to, tended to trump sometimes the need for analytical rigor and even practical cons considerations, you know, and you can tell when, you know, some unapplicable regulations and laws got into place, you know. And then in private practice, pragma pragmatic and practical rigor tends to trump uh, the need for deep thought or recognition of institutional constraints. So I'm trying, what I'm trying to do here is trying to balance this, uh, th th this tension, natural tension when you think about the Mexican economy. And I, and, but I, I do recognize that uh, sometimes that is difficult. So um, with that in mind, I address the following, the questions of financial stability and competitiveness with a premise uh, which I posit with a bit of a contrarian spirit, not in a, not, not to be an enfant terrible or something like that, but more to try to think a little bit outside the box. And the premise is, I, I believe that Mexico, the Mexican economy uh, suffers from what I call the Charlie Brown syndrome. <coughs> and, um, and I call this the Charlie Brown syndrome because I once saw a, uh, in the comic strips, when there were, you know, Sunday comics, <laughs> a, 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 a strip in, in Charlie Brown when Charlie Brown hadn't done his homework. 
because he went to play baseball the afternoon before. He loved baseball, you know, he loved to pitch and always lost, but he loved to, to play. And, uh, and he didn't do his homework because he went to play baseball. And the next morning, the teacher said, okay, everybody, I'm gonna ask one by one uh, things about homework. And if you don't get it right, you're gonna fail. And Charlie Brown started sweating. And he said, please God, please let the bell ring, sound, let the bell ring before I get called on. If the bell rings, I promise you God, that I will always do my homework before I go out and play baseball. And you know, sure enough, you know, students get called, and right before Charlie Brown gets called, the bell rings. And by then, Charlie Brown's a mess, no? Well, the bell rings, he sa get, gets saved, and what does Charlie Brown do? He reaches under his desk, he gets his glove, and says, let's go play baseball. <laughs> um, I, 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 I think that the Mexican economy suffers a little bit from the Charlie Brown syndrome. And let me explain why. Uh, from the fi first, the financial stability. I agree with Jaime that the uh, macroeconomic performance over the last two years, in particular through the crisis, has been exceptional. Uh, we were able to actually carry out in the Mexican economy and see in the Mexican economy something that hadn't, I don't think had been done in the previous 30 or 40 years, which is to extend and make r real a devaluation. That is, to devaluate a nominal devaluation to exceed increase in subsequent increases in prices. So we were able to obtain real exchange rate competitiveness, and that, that is a very peculiar uh, uh, experience. And it has a lot to do with really, really sound macroeconomic management. However, in order to really, th I think the deeper question, especially when we think of the title of today's conference, Mexico Today and Tomorrow, the question is, well, will tomorrow's macroeconomic balance sheet be, be, be sustainable? And here I, I, I would divide, in, in order to answer, I would divide the, 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 the analysis into two parts. One is what are the short-term indicators? And well, if you see short-term indicators, it seems that, yes, macro, macroeconomic stability <coughs> is, is pretty sustainable uh, by most measures. Debt over GDP ratios are, you know, in, in, in historically low levels, certainly financeable at, at this uh, at current and expected interest rates. Uh, the price of oil is, is, is high, and that uh, is, so, you know, Luis calls it the, 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 the savior, no? the, the savior of all mistakes, you know, like almost like a virgin, uh, Guadalupe. <laughs> Yeah, of Guadalupe, <laughs> not any version. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, if you take away, if you take, a, but, but I would like to propose to you that we also start looking and propose to thinkers and also policymakers to start looking at core indicators of macroeconomic performance. Or else the risk of suffering the Charlie Brown syndrome, that is, <clears throat> relaxing and saying, let's go play because we're really safe on this ground, it, it increases dramatically. And those core indicators for me are a little bit troubling. Number one, Jaime referred to it, the tax base remains exceeding, exceedingly small. Around 10% of GDP. Overall investment is you know, for, and when I call invest, I say investment, I refer to the energy sector, infrastructure in general, and educational investments remain as an aggregate around 5% of GDP. And, and a very important thing that only the people that transit through certain agencies get nervous about are the unfunded liabilities. Again, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to sound again like I'm talking, you know, <laughs> 
repeating things that are discussed in the, in the U.S. public uh, uh, forum, but there is an issue of unfunded liabilities in the Mexican balance sheet that is really troubling. And um, you all, all you have to do is talk to the last three directors of the Me Mexican uh, Social Security Institute. And, uh, and the thing is that, again, it's, it's like, Charlie Bourne, Char like Charlie Brown coming into class not doing our homework. And, you know, they're still calling on the, I'm sitting in the, Charlie Brown's sitting in the back row and they're still calling him in the front row. But eventually, they're going to call him. And this core indicator, I think, is, is, is problematic. And finally, there's the issue of fiscal federalism, which I struggled with as a, as a matter of public policy for many years. But that is still a huge challenge. Um, I'll, I'll, go, I'll, I'll just briefly say that the, and we'll probably, uh, as we wrap up, I was very taken by, by uh, the discussion of the, of the first panel. Uh, but, you know, I, I always tend to, 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 to get confused when, when, when we talk about democracy and, demo and, and democratic institutions and processes, uh, in part because I'm not a political scientist, but also in part because um, I, I think, and this is a personal impression, that uh, in Mexico we have taken democracy as a, as a or, or it's whatever anyone understands as democracy as an objective or a goal rather than a, an instrument or means. And certainly in fiscal federalism, the purpose of fiscal federalism is not just to, to hand out money to states. And there has never been a deep analytical analysis of the efficient way to distribute tax revenue and responsibilities in a, into 32 democratically or supposedly democratically elected uh, uh, societies, which may, in some cases and with some, uh, um, with some reason, may be seen sometimes as post-feudalistic or, or almost medieval kind of structures. So these core indicators for me tell me that there are areas of unsustainability in the macroeconomic balance. I suggest, moving forward tomorrow, as, as, you know, that uh, three basic ideas. One is that uh, we start targeting core indicators. And the, as a matter of policy, core indicators rather than short-term indicators are used to budget every year and determine uh, annual, annual, annual programs, almost as a time consistency check to make sure that we don't become what economists call time inconsistent. Second is, I was telling Luis to turn around and he said, hey, you know, you were involved in taxes. Oh, no, Jaime said, so he'll talk about taxes. Yeah, that was, you know, that was a very difficult. I was actually responsible for tax policy, among other years, in 1995, which is the year that um, the VAT was increased from 10 to 15 percent. I failed in my goal in proposing, of course, for many reasons, uh, uh, but I, my, my purpose at that time was to have the VAT increased in the general, in the, the general rate and to eliminate the, uh, all types of distortions from, from the indirect tax regime. But, you know, the dream has not died and I still think <laughs> I, I still, the dream lives on. And uh, I, 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 this number 15 to me keeps coming back in life. You know, I was married on the 15th. My daughter was born on the 15th, okay? Uh, so I, I, uh, I've, I, I've done some economic modeling with the number 15 all around, and things happen, <laughs> good things happen, okay? <laughs> so I was, I, I went, at some point, it's, it's not gonna be my generation, unfortunately. The new generation, hopefully, and certainly, if not, my daughter's generation is gonna say, these guys were nuts. Uh, I would like to at least at some point analyze what I call a 15-15 uh, 
economy in which we have a general VAT rate of 15% and a general tax corporate and personal income tax rate of flat of 15% with very little, uh, with uh, very little or no um, uh, deductions with the purpose of creating 15% of GDP tax revenues. If we, have, if we achieve that, I think we are going to really sol solve some of the core macroeconomic uh, uh, problems. Second proposal that I would make to, as moving forward has to do with governance. And this has to do a lot, again, this number, stupid number 15 keeps coming up, is a, we, the, 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 there was a change in federal law that allowed for more, for auctions to be used as means to determine prices and public procurement exercises. And we started doing it for the government, at this company that I manage now that has been doing public, uh, auctions, which is basically applied auction theory in the private sector for 10 years. We started doing it for the government last year, and we did it for Comisión Federal de Electricidad, for so, 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 uh, Seguri, uh, uh, IMSS, and for other institutions, including the Supreme Court of Mexico. And guess what the average savings were in our auctions? 15%. 15%. So, you know, that's, I'm, I'm like, this number just keeps coming back. But the important thing is that what I've seen in structuring auctions is that the paradigm for procurement changes. The paradigm for creating contestable markets change and the, and the behavior of suppliers, which is most important, and the relationship, institutional and business relationship to government also changes. On the microeconomic side, on the competitiveness front, I think that insertion to the world economy is crucial, as Jaime said. And here, again, I'll take a bit of a contrarian approach. And I think we are stuck again a little bit in a, or we have been stuck in our Charlie Brown syndrome for the last 16 years. Since NAFTA was implemented, uh, uh, it came into force, the North America agenda, I think, has economic agenda has stagnated. A lot has to do, yes, with U.S. politics and other things. But in Mexico, we have allowed that agenda to stagnate. Before NAFTA was being negotiated, I don't know if, Jaime, you were in those conversations. I, I was like, you know, a, a big, uh, at that point, you know, we had these internal discussions. What's the best agreement that we can have? What, we have a window of opportunity. It was, it was very difficult because the president at that time originally did not want anything to do with a free trade agreement. So first challenge was convincing the president <laughs> to, you know, look at the North America agenda as, as a Mexican matter of national interest. Uh, the, the, the president of the U.S. saw it as such at that time. Things have changed, but I do think that NAFTA, with all that it has done to create a framework, has stagnated, and we have f fallen into a world that at that time we called the dangers of inefficient trade, liberal trade liberalization. That is, NAFTA institutionalized some really really bad, bad things in the relationship. There's some, for example, the famous no's of all the countries. You know, we basically carved in stone what would never, ever be allowed to be touched by one of the, whether it was the cultural services in Canada or the oil industry in Mexico, but under the, you know, cloak of the NAFTA tr liberalization, we in fact institutionalized inefficiencies. My sense is that at sooner or later, maybe it may be later, this agenda has to be retaken. As, I, as Jaime said, and, uh, but, I, but I think with Jaime, where I, where I think, I think Jaime, I think even more uh, aggressively than Jaime, is that 
we have to, at some point to start to think of the North American market as a common market, as a customs union, or even as a completely integrated economic area. Three factors become critical in, in achieving this. One, I think, is the integration of the energy sector. Two, is the literal integration of a customs union, which, by the way, I think would resolve the issues of Korea, Korea and other uh, agreements that Mexico, Canada, or the U.S. have bilaterally signed. And three, allow us, give us an opportunity to address directly and forwardly the ma matters of regional security. This, I think, will uh, further, uh, would further, I think, uh, uh, make us time consistent from a competitive point of view and really contribute to Mex so Mexico can keep on trekking down the road of becoming very slowly, unfortunately, but uh, trekking the, down the road of becoming a nation of laws rather than a nation of individuals. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. We have uh, about 15 <coughs> minutes for 15. Oh, that was 15 <laughs> minutes. <Yeah>. 15. Oh, <laughs> <that's> uh, <amazing. laughs> Any questions or comments? Yes, please. There's one over there, please. Then Arturo. Um, hi, my name is Allison Lucas. I'm from Georgetown Public Policy Institute. Um, and I have a question for um, Pedro Noyola. Um, my question is looking at um, the idea of a more integrated um, economic market for, the, for North America. What role do you envision labor playing in that market, um, kind of political feasibility aside? Um, and if the borders were opened up for labor to cross, um, how do you, what effect do you anticipate that having on Mexico specifically? Um, and do you see it as being more of a positive thing for the Mexican economy in terms of um, growth and potential for more capital investment in Mexico? Or are there concerns about kind of brain drain and um, just kind of skill drain uh, with that? Gracias. Eh, bueno, un par de preguntas eh, generales. En primer lugar, eh, si podrían hablar un poco más del mercado interno mexicano, ¿cuál es el pronóstico? Porque yo creo que es, es un tema que está muy relegado. Y en ese sentido también, el, a, a, agregando este tema del empleo. ¿no? Eh, en segundo lugar, en términos comerciales, una pregunta más hacia, a, a, hacia Sabadowski, en el sentido de, bueno, eh, ¿por qué el Tratado de Libre Comercio con Europa ha producido tan pocos resultados? frente al Tratado de Estados Unidos. ¿no? Y una última, un último comentario que trataron los dos, que es eh, el tema de, digamos, de los ingresos y egresos fiscales de los estados, ¿no? eh, que es uno de los grandes obstáculos realmente. O sea, un tema muy el tema de la reforma fiscal se ha centrado sobre todo en digamos, o IVA o, este, o, o ingresos eh, fiscales generales, pero no se ha centrado para nada nunca en el tema de los ingresos de los estados. ¿no? que es la base de muchos de los estados federales en el mundo, ¿no? y de casi todos los estados, además. O sea, un estado con ingresos fiscales locales fuertes tiene todo esto, ¿no? Entonces, claro que este es un tema muy político, pero ¿cuál sería el prospecto en ese sentido? ¿no? Peter, and then... Well, why don't you start? Well, I, I have uh, several comments. Uh, first of all, I will try to address uh, one of my favorite topics, which is the European Mexico free trade. Usually in Mexico, what we, uh, there's a, this very, very widespread uh, uh, use of trying, a practice of trying to measure 
the success of a free trade agreement by the outcome of e either if it's a, a surplus, if it has a surplus or a deficit. And usually they look at the European-Mexico free trade agreement, and I would say not only the European-Mexico free trade agreement, but all other relationships that Mexico has, with the exception of the U.S., and you have a deficit. Well, first of all, a deficit or a superavit is a macro